Welcome back. Uh, now we have to, some questions from the people, the listeners who participated in the two lectures about Maria Zambrano legacy. And uh, I would like to put to, to you, uh, Professor Beatriz Caballero, these questions. The first question is from Fernando Herrero. Uh, he asks, how to understand that pensar desde el lugar sin límite, metaphysics, should we understand liberalism in political terms or a state without boundaries or limits? Many thanks. Fantastic. Um, thank you. It's, uh, I would like to start by saying that it's fantastic to see these uh, engagements and, and, and questions um, about Zambrano's thoughts. Uh, it's always a pleasure to, to have the chance to, to delve into it in a little bit um, more detail. And so to, to address the question, I think it's worth um, recontextualizing where that phrase pensamiento sin, sin limite comes from. So I've reproduced it here. I originally mentioned it um, as a quotation from Filosofía y Poesía, which is one of Zambrano's books that she published in 1939. And um, I'll, I'll read out the quote to you um, just to get um, a sense of context. So the quotation says, y su unión, la de la poesía con la palabra, la de la razón, no parece estar muy cercana todavía, porque todavía no es posible pensar desde el lugar sin límite en que la poesía se extiende, desde el inmenso territorio que recorre errante. So that limitless place refers um, in, in this context, in the context of filosofía y poesía, to um, the, the aspiration of something that starts from the word, from the logos, but uh, it overcomes the limitations that Zambrano identifies both with philosophy and with poetry. So um, it's not exactly, um, she's not exactly thinking language without limitations because um, that uh, a language without limitations uh, doesn't enable communication. The, the, the limitations are uh, constructed within the structure of a language for a language to be possible. But I think, whereas at this stage, 1939, which is still very early in her thought, is just an aspiration, what she means by this perhaps becomes, becomes much clearer later in her thought. So if we go, um, for example, to Claros del Bosque, um, it, I think it's been translated something like um, wood um, uh, glades, there she talks about nothingness. And the concept of nothingness is key to that book. And I think it links in very well with that uh, sense of limitlessness. Because what she thinks uh, is that it's, uh, she's thinking from a negative space. So that sense of nothingness is for Zambrano what enables true creativity. So it's the lack of um, limits that you encounter when you embrace a sense of nothingness. Thank you very much, great. Uh, then we have a question from Ernesto Gomez, and uh, he says, maybe a limit has something to do with the limitations or the boundaries of the language that configures and conditions our thinking, similarly to what Heidegger defended. Um, yes, I, I certainly think that Zambrano was um, concerned with the limitations of, of language, but um, I think she approached it in a, in a very different way from what Heidegger did. Um, there are certainly similarities. Zambrano is um, re, uh, recuperating um, words from day-to-day -day vocabulary and infusing them with deeply philosophical meanings. And that is, of course, reminiscent of Heidegger. But um, I think it's also, at, as, as, the, uh, as the question mentions, it's also deeply reminiscent of mysticism because uh, Zambrano aspires to enter the terrain of the ineffable. And she seeks to achieve this by constructing uh, layer upon layer of meaning. So, um, so yes, I think she's very close to mysticism. Some people um, associate her later thought with a mystical period. In my view, she is very much um, in line with uh, mystical thinkers. She's an avid reader of mystical writers, but I don't think she's a mystic herself, in my opinion. Okay. 
Great. Uh, third question again from Fernando Herrero. He says, yes, but what is language without boundaries? To go towards the ineffable? So some push towards the mystical, etc. Embrace of religion. Yes, I, I think this ties in with what we were saying earlier. She, she does realize that language requires boundaries and she works within those boundaries, pushing them constantly. And I think one of the ways she does that is that she, um, she plays with the, uh, with the possibilities uh, that are afforded by symbolism, metaphor, but also uh, with allegory, with, um, with mythology, and she explores and exploits all of those um, to, to construct a, a largely open language that is, uh, whose meaning is completed in, uh, in connection with the experiences of the reader. But having said that, the concept of limit is very important because if we were to say that her language is entirely open-ended, then we would be uh, in the realm of relativism. And I don't think Zambrano was a relativistic thinker at all. Um, also, apologies, uh, because I think I missed um, a part of the first question by Fernando Herrero, because he was asking as well about liberalism. Um, so yes, that was a part of the question. So if that's okay, I'll, I'll recap and, no and that as well. Because um, I think it is related, it is deeply related because Zambrano always starts from a place of language. But if we think back to her first book, uh, The Horizon of Liberalism, which was um, published in 1930, so her, her very first um, published monograph, so early thinking, um, she was still, um, it, this is where she developed the concept of liberalism more explicitly. And she addresses it from an ideological perspective. I think that was the question, whether it's political or something else. I think she's mostly concerned with idealism as an, sorry, with liberalism as an ideology. And her concern is that the aspirations of the ideology of liberalism, namely um, freedom, fraternity, and equality cannot be achieved um, from the structures of liberalism, particularly not from the socioeconomic structures of liberalism. And so instead, what she's proposing is a kind of spiritual liberalism. Um, what that means, um, it's, uh, it's very difficult to pinpoint because Zambarano uh, refused to provide any sort of program. She refused to give us specifics. And so that's all we have to go by, spiritual liberalism. Thank you. So it's a bit of an open question, Maria Zambrano. Yeah, a bit open. Okay, uh, so now we have a question. Um, um, uh, the question about the boundaries of language. Uh, Fernando, again, I put it to you. You have already answered? No. I think I have, yes. Okay, sorry. Uh, then we have the question from Simon Martinez. Great talk, mil gracias. We all hope for a world based on love and experience. What would Zambrano think of narcissism? See love of Facebook and Twitter. Self-love, sorry, of Facebook and Twitter. What hope for the realization of human potential that reason dangles before us? Thank you. That's that's a fantastic question, and um, I'm grateful that uh, that Simon Martinez picked up on the element of love in Zambrano's thinking because it's core. Um, she can be very critic, but at the same time, her thought is also very hopeful. So it's good to keep that in mind. Um, yes, narcissism is actually um, very much within uh, Zambrano's interest. And I think rather the words she would use, it's um, per perhaps that it's most suitable um, for uh, to, to address this within the Zambrano's um, language and context is probably ensimismamiento, which in English we could perhaps translate as self-absorption. 
So if we go back to the concept of narcissism, this is rooted in Greek mythology, and it takes us um, to uh, the myth of Narcissus uh, looking at his own reflection. Uh, reflections are very important uh, in, in Zambrano's uh, world, and uh, this ensimismamiento, this self-absorption, um, it's, it's a word actually that she takes from Ortega, but she gives her her own twist, and what she proposes is that we need to go inwards. We need to go inwards to be self-absorbed, to examine ourselves before being able to go outwards and pour ourselves out. So going back to narcissism, um, I think what we find today in the, uh, in the phenomenon or, our, or in our engagement with social media is that we seek our own reflection, but that reflection is found out outwards. It's found in our engagement with society outwards in, in social media. And also um, we seek our reflection, we examine uh, ourselves in terms of how others see us. And again, that is reflected on their interactions with that social media. So um, I, I think that Zambrano will probably um, think that we're missing a step that before uh, pouring out uh, in the way we do, we should probably reflect uh, more, uh, more than, than, than most of us do uh, in, in, in these days. Um, the other concept that I would like to bring in connection to the use of social media is perhaps that of noise, in that um, Zambrano's philosophy has a lot to do with sound. She considered that we learned by sound. Eh, aprender de oído, it's a phrase that she uh, enjoyed using often. And, and I think perhaps we live in a society in which we are overwhelmed, that our senses are overwhelmed, and uh, perhaps a way of um, summarizing it is an excess of noise. So I think that that uh, perhaps what, what we may be missing is a bit of that creative um, silence and a bit more inward um, looking. Uh, a, a bit more of, of a bit, a few more opportunities to look inward. To enjoy the silence, yes. Uh, Charles uh, uh, asks uh, you, why is Maria Zambrano's thought not so well known outside the Spain? Is there a lack of translations on her work? Yes, um, I think that's a fantastic question, and it's one that it's well worth. Um, thinking, reflecting about. And it's a complex one, actually. So on the one hand, I think we need to distinguish uh, the reception uh, in the Anglo-Saxon world from Zambrano's reception elsewhere. So Zambrano, it's very well known in Spain now. It hasn't always been the case uh, because of the peculiarities of her life and her circumstances. The fact that she spent so many decades in exile means that she was actually better known in some of the countries where she spent uh, years of exile, like Mexico, Puerto Rico, Cuba, uh, but also even Italy, uh, which is obviously not a Spanish-speaking country. And she is incredibly well known. She was uh, very well known then, and she remains a household name in Italy at the moment. Um, so uh, she she was, um, and she has been um, recognized uh, in these countries long before she was um, she became recognized and, and a well known figure in Spain, which only started um, happening uh, from from just I think just before democracy and certainly uh, with the advent of democracy, she became the well-known figure uh, that we know. Uh, now, if we turn to the um, English speaking world, it's absolutely true that she hasn't really permeated uh, the, uh, the English speaking uh, world for many years. Um, I think the lack or, or the very limited availability of translations is certainly one of the reasons there. There have been some translations though, and I would like to share uh, the PowerPoint with you again, because here you can see some of those translations. I think the first translation uh, that was produced, uh, it's the Lirio y Destino, it was uh, published uh, in the United States by Sunny University Press, translated by Carol Miner, 
and it was published in 1989. Now, this was uh, the only one, uh, the only um, book by Zambrano available in English for a long time. This is, I have to say, a fantastic translation and, uh, and, and a fantastic choice as well. This is um, uh, an autobiography, uh, a very peculiar type of uh, autobiography, which steps into a um, novel as well. Um, so um, it's, it's, it's very good to give us a flavor of Zambrano's life, but also of her writing style. Um, but it hasn't been until, sorry, um, is, where am I? Uh -huh, here we go. Um, so it hasn't been uh, until the year 2015 that uh, other translations have appeared. So here um, you have a bilingual anthology uh, published in 2015 and uh, a compilation, another uh, anthology uh, in 2018. I think the reason for this, it um, has to be cited that Zambrano is notoriously difficult to, she's, she's difficult to read in Spanish, particularly her later work, less so her earlier work, but she's notoriously difficult to translate uh, because as we were saying earlier, um, she constructs meaning um, with layer upon layer and that uh, poses a significant challenge to translators. So I think the work these translators are doing, and uh, I'm aware that more translations are currently uh, being undertaken. Uh, I think that this work is as difficult as it is important. So hats off to those translators who have decided to um, tackle Zambrano. Um, but um, I don't think this is the only reason though. Uh, I think uh, part of the reason uh, may well be as well uh, uh, Zambrano's own originality. Her own originality means that it's very difficult to place her within a particular discipline. Um, she certainly has not uh, um, followed the path of the Anglo-Saxon philosophical tradition. Um, she, she does engage very much with the European uh, philosophical uh, tradition, but even so, she has um, a difficult relation with that tradition um, because she's very critical of it. And as her thought evolves, she, uh, she, I think she steps aside and search, searches for something um, else. Um, I suppose the other reason is that when you think about Spanish philosophy uh, in, in the Anglo-Saxon context, in the English-speaking context, the, perhaps uh, uh, the towering figures of Unamuno and Ortega have often overshadowed uh, that of Zambrano. Having said that, I think that the situation is now changing and uh, Zambrano is um, arising a lot of critical interest. And um, I think um, that a number of books have been are, are being um, written, a number of critical monographs uh, engaging with her, with her thought are recently being translate, uh, being written in English and published in English. And I think this is a trend that it's uh, that is going to continue uh, for for a long time to come. Thank you very much, Beatriz. Uh, then we have now a question from Simon Martinez. Uh, he asks: Is Zambrano philosophy re released in the society of the spectacle developed by the Situationist International of 1968? Did they counter liberal reasons as counter revolution and lived the revolution as emotions, dreams, imagination, creating optimism? It's a, it's a difficult <laughs> question. <laughs> okay. I see. It, it really is because I think on the one hand, you can clearly see why uh, it, we could think that, uh, that the answer is yes because they, they do share a lot with Zambrano. They are critical of the uh, neoliberalist, neo-capitalist society that they were inhabiting, and they sought to um, other forms of engagement with reality and creativity, so they um, they sought to revalue um, other, um, uh, other elements uh, other than reasons such as dreams and uh, the creativity in, in general. However, 
the reason why I'm hesitant is um, the word realization. I think um, I think the point I was making um, in, in the uh, earlier in the talk was that some poetic reason uh, was born as an aspiration, and even uh, in her later work, once that poetic reason started taking shape, and and she could say that she found what poetic reason was all about. Even then, I think that perhaps the most um, productive way of understanding poetic reason in this context is her metaphor of the horizon. Because um, poetic reason, um, she, when she describes the horizon, she, she says that it's a place that you can see in the distance, uh, that you can gather your bearings by looking at it. Once you identify your horizon, you know where you are and you know where you're going. And that's something that poetic reason does for us. It's, it gives us, it's a sort of compass. It's, it's, uh, it makes it clear for us what we should be seeking. But at the same time, just like the horizon, it remains always equidistant from us. So uh, the more we approach it, uh, the more it recedes uh, to, to our side. And, and this is good. I mean, I think in our society, we put a lot of emphasis on achievement. And, and we feel that we are leaving something out, that we have failed if we haven't fully achieved something. And I don't think Zambrano would agree with this emphasis. Um, going back to her philosophical roots, um, traditionally, she's, well, she's very critical of the uh, excessive emphasis that philosophy has put on being. Um, already from the ancient Greeks and from Parmenides, Parmenides was talking about there's only being, and that means that uh, there's unity and immobility. The problem with that is that Zambrano says that you have to leave room for not being. In other words, for that which we are not yet for the possibility of becoming, of stepping into that unknown, for, for the very existence of a possibility which is not yet. And this is what the horizon does, is that constant uh, distance that exists between who we are, our actualization, and who we may be, uh, who we may become. Similarly, I think poetic reason is not, it's, it's, it's inhabits the space of possibility rather than the, the space of realization. And so I think that's that's the main reason why I would be hesitant to say that poetic reason has been fully realized in any one movement. Uh, thank you. Um, Charles, this is the last question. Um, with the political situation of the renewed rise of anti-democratic ideologies of, of the world crisis generated by COVID, how would Maria Zambrano reflect on today's world? I think that's a fantastic question to end up with. Um, and I have to say, it's always difficult and a bit dangerous to step onto somebody else's shoes um, to venture what they would think. Uh, but in this case, I'm very confident, I'm fairly confident to say that Zambrano would be very concerned about uh, these anti-democratic uh, movements and, dare I say, even about the current state of our democracy. Uh, but don't take my word for it. I think it's best if we um, let Zambrano say that um, or, or speak to that effect in her own words. I've taken the liberty to take um, a quote. Here we are. Um, to, to borrow a quotation from Persona y Democracia, which is the book that she devotes to reflecting upon democracy. And uh, there she states, Es más obvio que nunca que la democracia es el único camino para que prosiga la llamada cultura de Occidente. Y esta revelación pone al descubierto, hoy más que antes, la estructura sacrificial de la historia humana. So, I love this quote because um, there's, there's no question in Zambrano's mind that for uh, Western culture to have any hope of, uh, of, of succeeding, of proceeding, um, it has to be rooted upon democratic uh, values. Um, but it also highlights what the core problem that she envisions is, which is what she names the sacrificial structure of um, human history. So in other words, um, in her interpretation, uh, history has been built upon the sacrifice 
of many along the way. It's only by that sacrifice of a section of society that what we call progress or, or that uh, history could uh, move on and advance. And we can clearly see that um, now in the context of COVID, um, linking with the second part of the question. So COVID-19 is of course uh, a health challenge, it's a medical challenge, but it's a challenge that needs to be addressed from a particular um, socioeconomic and political standpoint. And uh, what Zambrano, uh, I think, uh, would uh, contribute to this is that we must be keenly aware of the sacrificial cost any decisions we take will have. So we need to take into consideration, uh, of course, uh, issues of fairness, equity, um, priority, and any time we take a decision along those lines, we are uh, prioritizing a group over uh, a, a different group uh, to, the, uh, uh, to the cost, to the sacrifice of a different group. And I think uh, that uh, what Thamrano emphasizes is that we cannot be uh, fully a person, uh, uh, we cannot have a fully democratic society, we cannot flourish until everyone in our society flourishes. And so um, I, I don't want to leave things um, with a negative um, note. And I would, I would like to emphasize, to end up by emphasizing that despite this criticism, um, Thamerno is also uh, very hopeful. Uh, hope is very much at the core of her message, is very much at the core of her thought. And she's not relying on institutions uh, to solve problems for us. She has a very much a bottom-up approach and she thinks it is up to each one of us to uh, meet the challenges uh, that come uh, our path and to step up to step up to the situation and to make the transition from being an individual into being a person. And that requires looking at everyone else around uh, and ensure that they have a chance to flourish as well. So if we have time, if that's okay, before we, we leave, I would like to end up with a different quote, uh, one that I think is more hopeful than this one. <laughs> Um, so what she's, this is the way she ends up the book, by the way, this is the last, the very last paragraph in Persona y Democracia. And she says, Si el hombre occidental arroja su máscara, si renuncia a ser personaje en la historia, quedará disponible para elegirse como persona. Y no es posible elegirse a sí mismo como persona sin elegir al mismo tiempo a los demás. Y a los demás son todos los hombres. Con ello, se, no se acaba el camino, más bien empieza. So I like this concept of um, finishing a book with starting the road, with, um, with the road that um, starts ahead of us. And so I think she is hopeful that we may yet uh, be able to leave the mask behind, leave the character and embrace the person uh, that we were born to become. Thank you very much, uh, Beatriz Caballero. It was great, uh, the great answers, great questions. Thank you very much to the public for your participation. And quoting the end of your, of your uh, uh, time and your small, it was like a small lecture at the end and very, very good. Uh, so the road to, to the knowledge, uh, deep in the knowledge of Zambrano, it has just started. We invite you for the next uh, project we have together with Professor Beatriz Caballero, and uh, I hope you have enjoyed this presentation. Thank you very much and see you soon. Thank you. Thank you.